our stories of the year, top five stories of the year, because of course, 2019 is about to close out. I think it's important to take a, a look at the year in review. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you actually go first, but before you give your first pick, I'm going to give honorable mention. Ah, yes. Honorable mention because it didn't wind up being huge in the news, even though it was really important. It just didn't get a lot of news coverage. Uh, the death of al-Baghdadi. That was wonderful. Like, mm -hmm. how did that not make huge news? Well, there was just so much other stuff going on. Well, I guess you, if you count, like, the Washington Post obituary, that was kind of big. Yeah, I mean, like, the media did talk about it, but I think part of it happens to be, like, if you ask me, it's just as big as Osama bin Laden being killed. But the re there's two reasons why it didn't become as big a news story. First of all, al-Baghdadi has committed a lot of really terrible terrorist attacks and been responsible for orchestrating them, but they all happened over there. That's true. It's like 9-11. Like right. The difference with Osama bin Laden is 9-11, so that story hit home for a lot more people in a, in a more personal way. Yeah. And I think that that's one thing that made a really big difference. The second thing is the media really didn't want to give Trump credit for it. Yeah, that's true. And they, they were dancing all around that. Right. Like when uh, when Obama did it, like they were all over that because they wanted to give, you know, Obama a boost, especially considering his election was coming up. Oh, yeah. And so with President Trump, I think they kind of intentionally downplayed it. I don't know if they actually sat down and made a decision, let's downplay it to hurt Trump. It was more like the excitement wasn't there. Yeah, I think that's probably true. And I think... You know, I think that's probably the most we have ever seen our military praised, mm -hmm. probably because they wanted to so much subvert it from Trump that they kind of put it on the uh, the military. So that was nice. Which but here's the thing: right. to a degree, I don't disagree with that. I just wish that they did it consistently. No, they don't. Because the way the media tried to portray the death of Osama bin Laden, like they almost wanted to paint a picture of Obama rappelling down the side of a building with an <laughs> AK-47 in hand to take him out himself. Yeah, yeah. And I anyway. think you know, because next year is 2020 and it's election year, so they're kind of like, yeah, let's not help him out anymore. Yeah. All right. So what's your number five? Okay. So I'm going to do it the right order this time. <laughs> All right. So I think along those lines, Trump's Thanksgiving trick. Around the same time, and he sends the motorcade to the golf course. So of course, the media is like, oh, my goodness. He's going golfing at Thanksgiving. Yeah. You know, what a horrible president. Mm -hmm. When in truth, he's on an airplane going to Afghanistan to feed Thanksgiving dinner to a bunch of military people like that. You know what? Yeah. That's good. That's really good. That was hilarious because I think he... He knows what the media does, and he kind of played into that, and he just pulled it right over him. It was great. Well, now I'll say this about Trump. There, there's a lot of things that I like about him, a lot of things I dislike about him. But one thing that has to be one of the, the best things about Trump is the guy knows how to play the media like a fiddle. Like, he, he does it better than any politician, right or left, I've ever seen. It's probably why they hate him so much, but it's great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's probably amusing to us. That, yeah. Um, all right. So, my number five. Uh, media bias. The, and this, is that like the whole year or? <laughs> well, yes, because there were several smaller stories that occurred throughout the year that kind of showed this. And the, the biggest ones that I could think of were the two shootings in El Paso and Dayton, Ohio. Yeah. Because not only did they get the, not only did they get the story wrong, it was very obvious that they were trying to skew it in a direction that it wound up not going. Yeah. Like for example, with the El Paso shooting, they tried to paint him as some kind of white supremacist that, that hated Mexicans and didn't want them to be in the country, which, by the way, was true. But they tried to couple that with, and he was a big Trump supporter. And oh, then they yeah. left out the part that the reason that he didn't want people immigrating to the United States was because he was an environmental terrorist and was afraid that overpopulation was going to lead to like starvation and the environment being destroyed and global warming. So like they left that out. part out. And the fact that he hated Trump, like they, they leave certain details out to try to craft a narrative to their liking. And then when it comes out, it's very obvious that they picked and choose. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen that all year. And but definitely uh, with that story. Dayton, Ohio was kind of the same thing. They left out certain details that were less uh, favorable to them. And then another one that I think really kind of helped people show and, and even convince some people that were on the fence about the media that they really do have it in for somebody and have it in for one particular side was the Covington kids. Oh my goodness. Like mm. that was crazy. Especially when you juxtapose it to the whole Greta Thunberg thing, you know, if you criticize her, then you're a monster. Yeah. But 
if you criticize a Covington kid, eh, you know, you're a hero. Well, and that's the thing. They they literally the difference with that story and the reason I think that one was so significant is because that is a story they literally made out of whole cloth. Yeah. Like they complete, if you watch any of the video in context, which I did, I watched like the entire hour and a half video. Um, it completely changes the narrative to the exact opposite of what the media was saying. And that's what I think was so important yeah. is that to anybody that was willing to do like a millisecond worth of research, you could tell that the media saw a story and a narrative that they liked, ran with it, and didn't do any fact-checking. They specifically took things out of context. They tried to pull the wool over your eyes. And this is the story that I think really showcased that better than any other one all year. I agree with that. Mm. I mean, it was it was like they took two seconds out of a video and it was mm -hmm. like, oh, this is terrible. It, just, it was ridiculous. It was like completely flip-flopped. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, that was a good showcase of it all. Yeah. Um, all right. So what's your number four? Uh, okay. So this is very close to my heart because mm -hmm. I care a lot about the subject. Jeffrey Epstein did not kill himself. You know, I'm going to take issue with that statement. You feel like he did kill himself? Yeah. Are you just saying that so Clinton doesn't come here and kill you? No, no, I would never say that. And I don't know why you would even suggest that. Uh, Hillary Clinton's a wonderful human being and would never hurt anyone. Guys. In fact, I think she should be president. Do you feel suicidal right now? Not at all. And if anybody does, you know, say that Caleb committed suicide, please investigate. Because I would never do that. <laughs> yeah, I think... I'm just saying. <laughs> I think that's important. We have I, that on air. I don't even own cotton sheets. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> this should be said now. <laughs> hey, um, you have a Christmas tree in the background right behind you. There, I do. Right? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know how many of those ornaments hung themselves? None of them. None of them. <laughs> Much like a Jeffrey Epstein. Much like Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> that was just the craziest thing. I think probably my favorite thing about that whole story is that, you know, it probably would have not gotten half as much attention as it did, except for the fact that the internet took it and ran. I mean, the memes have mm -hmm. been great. Yeah. The, uh, the biggest social media stories of the year have definitely been Epstein, Baby Yoda, and Screaming Lady and the Cat. Yeah, I mean, it's been memes. and I think like a lot of our media is controlled by memes. And so like the year before, I think was Brad's wife. Oh, yes, Brad's wife. And then before that was Harambe. Rest in peace, Harambe. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I think our biggest stories are things that happen because of memes. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I think that that does have a much bigger impact on the media that people uh, believe. I, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield recently came out. No. And of course, I got it. Uh, the day it came that out. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, there was actually, it didn't happen, unfortunately, because I would have loved this. There was a petition to have a Harambe Pokemon. And Why he was, wouldn't they? He was going to be fighting to start out with. He was just a big gorilla. And then his second form that he evolved into was fighting ghost type, <laughs> which would have been hilarious. I just need that to happen. I wish it would have. There was a petition that got like more than, I think it was over two, two million signatures. I mean, I think the Epstein story, much like that, I mean, it's yeah. proof that memes work because I don't think it would have been investigated as much had it not been for the memes. Well, see, that's the thing. That's really something that has changed a lot in our society is that there was a time where to drive a media or, or sorry, to drive a narrative home you needed to have the media at least kind of on your side, mm -hmm. at least interested. Now, really doesn't matter. Like if enough people put out memes or posts or whatever about something and it keeps and holds the public interest, it can kind of steer the media a little bit, which, you know, I think is actually a positive thing. It is, because I think a lot of the tricks that we're seeing the media play right now with media bias and all mm -hmm. of that, it's not working. That's what's interesting is that it's not working. The internet is largely controlling. Facebook is largely controlling. People are able to talk about these issues. We've seen that with impeachment stuff. It's like, you know, the media is pushing this narrative about, oh, it's terrible. And they're showing you bits and pieces that go favorably for these hearings. Right. But when you look at the polling, everybody's like, well, this is full of bull, you know? Well, see, and that I think is is probably the most important thing. This is why we cannot lose the social media fight, because we're finally getting to the point to where the media can't just have their way and do whatever they want to. And if YouTube and Facebook and Twitch and or, sorry, Twitch, Twitch is another thing, although 
Is that the video game thing? Yeah, but I'm okay. on there. Like, we're broadcasting on there. Oh, wow. Um, So th they do non-video game streams, too. But Twitter and Greetings, everything else. gaming nerds. Yes. Glad to have you with us. Um, But if we lose that ground, if we lose that fight, then we'll be back where we were 20 years ago, where if the media doesn't like a story, they'll just sink it. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of great. I mean, mm -hmm. the public is finally back in control of the media in several ways. And they're pushing back. But I mean, yeah, there's definitely some really room hard. for improvement, but that that's the reason that this whole censorship and trying to silence conservative voices is, is so important that we, we win that fight. Now, not my number four, uh, the Sri Lanka church bombing. Really? Yes. Yeah. And I think that the reason it's so significant is even though it was something that was a far off and typically with Americans, especially things that don't happen in the U S it's almost like they don't happen. Um, this one really drew some interest to the, you know, the, the struggle that's been going on over there. Yeah. Which people had been kind of asleep to beforehand. And another thing that it did, it was a very, it was the biggest one that I can remember of a, a church being attacked that people actually paid attention to it because it's a shame that it's this way, but you know this as well as I do. To be honest, we've gotten to a point to where church attacks are so common they really don't register a blip on the radar anymore. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I, I really would. And especially, I think part of that probably is because they're churches. Mm -hmm. If it were something else, it wouldn't be as ignored. But I think, you know, Christian persecution is being largely ignored. So that's probably a huge part of it. I think that is part of it. So what's your number three? Oh, I'm telling you, i got to keep it. So... One of my favorite things this year was uh, Storming Area 51. Because, like, I followed this. I was excited about it. We talk about memes driving something. Yeah. yeah. I, so I love it when people do this stuff. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. So and I'm following this on Facebook. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is going to happen. This is going to be great. Of course, I was just ready to watch people be stupid. I was about to say, I knew you weren't going to. You just wanted to be sitting on the sidelines with, like, a bucket of popcorn. Basically, yeah. That's exactly yeah. how I felt about it. So, I, you I know, the that. day comes and it's like, what, two people? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, it's the dumbest thing ever. See, now that's great. See, now that's the inverse of the social media thing is that a whole lot of people that are activists behind the keyboard, when it comes to actually doing something, they're like, mm, no. <laughs> it was great. I mean, I'm just like, uh, Seinfeld's all right. on. <laughs> we could have found out the truth about aliens, but you know what? You all didn't want to get off your couch. I remember when Chuck Norris actually tweeted out that he was going to join. I was like, well, we don't even need anybody else. That was like, the best of yeah. all of it. I just love the involvement with the celebrities there. It was pretty funny. That's like one of the few things celebrities did that I actually thought was productive. You're right. <laughs> anyway. All right. So my number three also involves activism in a different way. The Hong Kong protesters and the, uh, and the um, uh, oh, why am I blanking on this? Uh, Venezuela po protesters. That's good. Because it amazes me that, like, I don't know, two or three years ago was the year of the protester, and the protesters were Time Magazine's person of the year and all this other stuff. <laughs> they were protesting minor things compared to what these people are. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're I mean, looking at major injustice in Hong Kong. I mean, major. yeah, major injustice in Hong Kong, uh, very serious threats at creating a massive surveillance state where free speech is not only not allowed, it's monitored 24-7. Uh, the social program where you basically get social points and you're not allowed to do certain things in society like, uh, oh, if, if you're anti-government, you just don't get to buy those tickets to a concert or you don't get to ride the subway, you have to walk. Like Things like yeah. that. Th them trying to control an entire society through social engineering and people standing up and saying, no, we're human beings, this is not how you treat people. Yeah. To me, that was the big thing of the, and and of course Venezuela too. Like people are literally starving because of socialism over there, and they're saying, no, this isn't right. We should be able to control our government. You know, that wasn't reported on by the media hardly at all. Probably mm -hmm. because a lot of the media is trying to craft this narrative of, hey, socialism is good, but we're seeing two. Well, also probably terrible. Also too, because uh, an awful lot of the people on stage at the Democrat debates were big fans of Venezuela oh my gosh, <laughs> back in the a day. Horrible place. You know, and probably one of my favorite things about the whole Hong Kong story and the Hong, Hong Kong uh, protesters yeah, is that they were waving the American flag, singing our national anthem, and praising Trump. Of course the media is not going to pick up on this. I mean, 
That's like in the same week as the whole Al, Al Baghdadi thing and the you Trump know, trick in the media. It's that, a great week. That created the greatest internet clip maybe of all time. Yeah. And I couldn't play it on the air because there's a, a word that I don't allow on my show in there, but it's a Chinese guy that they're uh, they're interviewing. He says, why, why do you like President Trump? Because cause Trump don't trust China. China is a-hole. <laughs> I lost it when I saw that. You just tell it like it is. <laughs> he knows uh, what's up. That guy needs his own talk show. <laughs> I would listen to that guy. I, I'd watch. All right. Um, so what's your number two? So, okay, recently uh, Snopes, or no, but the Babylon Bee put out an article saying that uh, the Democrats are pushing impeachment so that Trump would be elected, right? Or basically ensuring that he yeah. would be elected. And the White House thought it was funny. It was either like Trump or was some staffer at the White House. I can't remember which. But somebody retweeted the story. And Snopes writes a letter to the White House like, Oh, you're in trouble now. You're pushing fake news. And it's like, this is the second time that Babylon B has, uh, or that the Snopes has checked, fact checked, the Babylon B, a Christian satire. Not true. They have fact checked Babylon B now at least seven times. Oh my gosh! Mm-hmm. I mean, will they ever ever learn? Nobody takes the Babylon B seriously, <laughs> though their though their titles do actually become dangerously close to on point. But see, that's the thing that interests me about the Babylon B. Like their satire. Like I have to look at some of the headlines. I'm like, is that satire? Or is that real? And I have to look <laughs> at it. I mean, some of them are eerily close to true. I don't know if that's commentary on the Babylon Bee or if that's commentary on our times. I think it's commentary on our times. <laughs> yeah. but It's so bad. It could be satire. <laughs> but that's the thing that's so funny. And uh, what I really liked is, I don't know if you knew this part of it, but did you know that Snopes actually did a second article after that, uh, basically trying to explain why they fact-checked the Babylon Bee? No. Yes. and they There's did, no explaining that. They did a study. Cute. And I'll tell you why the study is, is bullcrap. They did a study that suggested that people couldn't tell the difference between the Babylon Bee and a real news site, and they couldn't tell the difference in their headlines and real headlines. Cute. Here's the kicker, though. When they handed them the headlines, they took out all the parts that made it look like satire. And so they just took some of the most realistic-looking headlines and took out the parts of the story that made it clear it was satire and said, can you tell the difference in this and a real news story? And the average person couldn't. Well, duh! You know, I, I sometimes Like, have you a can hard recut time. an episode of Friends and make it look like a thriller. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, they did that to The uh, the Office before. Made it yeah. look like My Cousin Rachel. But, it, you know, I right. do struggle with stuff like that. I mean, I struggle with telling whether Snopes is relevant or completely irrelevant. And I lean towards completely irrelevant. I think mm. I'm on point. Well, I mean, I think the Snopes story is kind of an example of that. Uh, but my number two is the deep state. Oh, the deep state. And I was, Why is that a good thing now? Well, like, it's, so it's the not. Democrats. The Democrats are now pushing that as a good thing. I know. It's not. It's, it's ridiculous. But here's the thing. I was somebody that, especially when it was early in Trump's presidency, it, it's not that I didn't believe that there were entrenched bureaucrats, because, of course, everyone believes that. But I didn't think there was a concerted, organized effort within these different departments to try to hinder Trump's presidency. And granted, it never reached the level that some of the Alex Joneses of the world claimed that it did. Yeah. But it's surprisingly organized. And it does exist. It's crazy. Um, And what's really just absolutely astounding about this is, especially in the State Department, You can tell based on some of their testimony, some of the things that they put out there and things we've actually been able to gain from the attempted impeachment inquiry that there are people. And and this was the most telling thing to me out of the entire testimony, not the stuff we learned about Trump and his intentions, but rather that their attitude is Trump needed to be stopped. And we made an effort to stop him because he was not following State Department protocol. And I'm sitting there like. He He's the to. executive. He's in charge of the State Department. His protocol is your protocol. I mean, it's reason 5,000 that agencies are, you know, dangerous things. I mm-hmm. think people don't talk about that enough because you're just like, oh, it's an agency. This is what they do. They're not supposed to exist at all, people. That's not how this works. Well, I don't have a problem with agencies. But when you have an agency with people inside them that are specifically set up to subvert 
the results of an election, then it becomes really dangerous. Oh, yeah. Because then the government is basically on autopilot and nothing that the American people can do will change that. And that is terrifying. I'm, I'm actually legitimately afraid of what's going to happen in 2020. I think because, you know, whereas before they're saying like the popular vote was won by Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Yeah. Election. So I think probably what's going to happen here is that Donald Trump might actually win both. And it's still go to the Democratic candidate. Oh, they've already set that up. They've been laying the groundwork for weeks now saying, I mean, Adam Schiff the other day just said that uh, basically putting off the uh, impeachment inquiry is saying, why don't we just let him steal another election? Which, A, your evidence didn't even show that he stole the first one. Oh my gosh. And and B, and this was the really funny part about Schiff saying that, uh, neither of the charges they brought against him for impeachment had anything to do with the 2016 election. <laughs> neither of those charges are even real. No. That's my thing, is that it's not a real crime. Listen, I can tell you this as a certified lawyer. Well, the first lawyer, one is. It's not a thing. <laughs> now, now, the second one, obstruction of Congress, definitely is. Yeah. Courts have ruled on that many, many times. No, and the second one is, but it's not even what he... But abuse of power did. itself is not a crime. It's the specific abuse of power that is a crime, and they haven't yet designated what that is. No, because they can't find it. Well, yeah. So what's, uh, I guess you're up to number one, right? Well, number one, my top story of the year. Yeah. And I know that I have less of a stake and in investment in this than you do, sure. but I feel very strongly about it because, mm-hmm. well, if you live in Alabama for any length of time, you probably would too. But, uh, Auburn kicked Alabama's butt in the iron bowl this year. And that's War number Eagle. one. War Eagle. That was a great show. That was a great game. That was an excellent game. I mean, on my toes. I wanted to kill time. myself most of it, but it was an excellent game. <laughs> Look, I've been wearing. Up. Wait, I take that back, and I hope Hillary Clinton didn't hear that last line. <laughs> I didn't. He is not I didn't think about. And it's not football season anymore, so you can't use that excuse. I'm yeah. safe for nine more months. Maybe. <laughs> I had a. Um, I've been wearing a 30 day event monitor for heart monitoring, and anyway, mm-hmm. just normal cardiac stuff. But right, they, wearing it during the game, I'm like, oh, they're gonna call me any minute, like. What, ma'am, you need to calm down. Like you, I don't know what you're doing right now, but you need to stop that. <laughs> you know that would not surprise me, but yeah, a great story. I I have no problem with it being your top one, uh, top story. I'm I'm kind of surprised it was just because I know you you're a Tennessee girl. You know I was, but then they were really sucky this year, so I kind of paid more attention to Auburn this yeah. season. Yeah, I understand that. I mean, yeah. there's there's years where Auburn's definitely been not good. I mean, we all remember 2015, which we just kind of pretend didn't happen. But anyway, all right. So my number one story of the year, and I know that you're going to really like this one too. Nine states go after abortion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To me, that Huge is the fan. number one story of the year. And I, I want to show the audience a graphic here. Uh, this is put out by the New York Times. This is a graphic, and the chart shows you at what point in pregnancy abortion is banned. Way up there at the top, number one, from day one of pregnancy, Alabama. I mean, we're killing it. Mm -hmm. We're killing it with our laws. Proud to be from my state. And I know you've got Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Ohio all in order right after that. But Alabama... Still leading the charge, still number one. I mean, and wait till all of them get sued for these laws. I think that's going to build up a really good case for the Supreme Court. Now, do I think it will go far enough? No, I think these laws are not the way to go. But I think when you build them up, they're actually going to be a good, you're going to see a really good case come out of this. Yeah, well, one thing that I I think was so important about this one is that I really do believe, because this happened very early in the year, I really do believe that New York's abortion law that's basically unrestricted anytime you want to for any excuse that you can think of. Like you could literally tell your doctor, I don't think I can afford this baby. Okay. Abortion. That's problem. And I think that that really made a lot of Christians that had kind of been on the sidelines, kind of sleepwalking through it, not really paying attention, kind of looked at it as a, a lost cause. They're like, Oh, these, these people are serious and they really do want abortion on demand. And it caused a lot of them to wake up and say, no, we have to do something about this. Yeah. I think that was really, it's one of the very few legitimately grassroots movements that I've seen in the country in a long time. Yeah. And that actually, that timing was perfect Mm -hmm. when it lined up with how Alabama's law got passed. Right. So that was, that was pretty effective. And another thing too, and this is interesting and, and this is, Partly those laws, and partly because abortion is getting less popular, 
millennials and Gen Zers are the most pro-life generation since the greatest generation, which I'm very proud of. Yeah. I mean, that's not talked about enough. It really isn't. You hear more of the minority view. But yeah, for the most part, you know, millennials and Gen Z, very pro-life. I think you're seeing a great trend. I think, you know, as much of a fight as we can put into it, it's only going to continue. And sort of a result of that fight, because of course the laws are a result too, but even more important than the laws are the actual actions. Did you know, I read a story the other day that in the past couple of years, one third of America's uh, abortion clinics have shut down. No, it's wonderful. There are abortion clinics shutting down left and right. I mean, there's a good chance that the new Planned Parenthood plan to open up in Birmingham is not going to be able to do that because of a, uh, because of the Alabama law. And so they're, they're looking into whether or not it'll actually open on schedule or not because of that thing. And And so... I mean, this is just, it gives me a lot of hope. That's a good thing. Yeah, I've got a lot of, fr- I've got some friends in the pro-life fight that have been doing what they can to make sure the Birmingham one doesn't open up. So that's a, you know, I think that helps a lot. Like I said, I'm still not a fan of the Alabama law. It's not because I'm against, you know, pro, uh, pro-life pro laws. I just think it's really crappy. But anyway, that's a whole different thing. But I think, you know, I think it's showing a good positive trend. I think if nothing else, we're seeing that largely publicly, the movement is towards pro-life, mm-hmm. you know, despite what you see in the media. Just in case you were wondering, yes, I am a straight white Christian male and a small government constitutionalist, which means I have no chance of getting any help from the government and wouldn't accept their help even if they offered. Which means I'm going to need you to like and subscribe because my gun collection is not going to pay for itself.